Hey, this is Carla from the Butcher Babies. This is George Corp from the Fisher from Kendall Court. Hey, this is Rex from Kill Devil Hill. It's Wednesday 13. This is from Water. You're listening to Rabbit Noise. On Rabbit Radio. Turn it up. You are listening to Rabbit Noise on Rabbit Radio. That was Miscellanea from 10 Years, latest album from Birth to Burial. And the band will be in the country kicking off their run of shows with Dead Letter Circus. And here to talk about the tour from the band is Tater and Jesse. How you going, guys? Uh, great. What's up? Chilling. Day off. Awesome. You were saying before, you, you're uh, on tour with Breaking Benjamin, right? Yeah, right now. We got, we're got. we almost done with it. What, two weeks? And then, as we were talking about, we hop over the pond. Yeah, we head your way. You guys must be pretty stoked coming back. Yeah, Australia is awesome. I would want to go just live there. It's like the best rock and roll. We did Soundwave recently. And it kind of rejuvenated my belief and love and rock and roll and people that still uh, get it and are into it. And everything from Pennywise to AFI to Crosses to Eagles of Death Metal to Green Day to Allison Chain. I mean, just on down the line. In America, it's real big, like, well, your band doesn't sound like our band. And if you can't, you know, over there, it was like, we don't care. It's all awesome. It's all got room to breathe and be. So. It was just great. I mean, we must have, that first day, I bet I walked 10 miles just going from stage to stage watching bands. So it was the coolest. So we love Australia. It keeps us fit. That's yeah, it one. does. <laughs> That's the one day I get a lot of exercise. So yeah. <laughs> it's pretty awesome. Well, uh, that track we played before um, uh, from the album, I think that's that's my uh, favorite track. That's, uh, that groove, man, it just gets you. Uh, thank you. I mean, it, it's kind of hard to... to narrow it down and pick a single when we're so deep in when we're writing the record and we kind of try to step away from it for a minute and just listen to it with fresh ears and also get other people's argue, re- argue with other people about it yeah their their first reactions because you only have uh one chance to make a first impression so you try to go with Which what song is it? So miscellaneous land yeah it hits in pretty hard yeah yeah it jams yeah are you guys going to be playing that one uh, on the tour Sure. Oh, yeah, we'll do it acoustic. We'll do it light and soft. <laughs> <laughs> no, we'll be playing me, it just like it is. To me, the guitar riff reminds me of like an old corn riff, like we used to listen to, like the or early corn when they were still super heavy and pretty dirty, you know? Yeah, so it's, it's, cool, it's really got a really cool, cool stomp, man. I love it. It's uh, it's sure. going to go off live. So uh, do you find that the more albums you, you guys record that, you know, your personal favorites change? Uh, yeah, I mean, because... You you get so caught up in the writing process that you really can't see it, the forest for the trees, because you're so deep in it. But then when you step back, sometimes there'll be songs that you fight and fight and fight to make them work. And then by the end of it, it didn't turn out the way you wanted it. And then there'll be other songs that just out of nowhere will be the one that sticks out and really is is the, the I guess, the unexpected hero of them. And that's the beauty of just, just writing music. And being able to record it onto, like, we record with our old drummer, an original 10 years band member, drummer and guitarist, uh, Brian Bodine. And he's, you know, we've got Pro Tools at home so we can sit and go, you know, let's listen to this, like, in this order, this arrangement. Using Pro Tools as a tool to make our art better, not to make it sound better, but to make our art better and to make it where we get. And we went and did Autumn Effect or most of those records. You had a month or two, and whenever it was done, it was done. So we could take longer, take our time, make sure we like the arrangements. Basically, me and Brian would write a lot of the music. Jesse would tear it apart and put it back together the way he wanted it. He would have ideas, which I did. I don't want to hear his ideas until they're done. Because <laughs> it's tedious. It's a little it's tedious. tedious, and I'll find, I, we call it demoitis. So I'll fall in love with the part, and then he'll go in there and be like, "No, it's too typical, or it's too whatever." And then I'll get mad at him, and then I realize I shouldn't be here and just show up later. <laughs> you don't need to know it. Until I don't it's need done. to know it until it's done. Yeah. <laughs> it's a demoitis. We've all got it for years, for from years on and off, you know. But it seems to work. Yeah, yeah. The the last two records have we've just really been able to have all the freedom we want to, like you said, sort of put the songs together and tear them apart because when we were, were writing and recording simultaneously at the same time, so for six months in the studio, we can change us. Sometimes it's it's almost, it can get in the way because it allows us just to keep tearing it apart. Try every Every possible. And sometimes you can just spin your wheels till your yeah, head falls but off. I mean, but it really does allow you to... to 
create songs that you wouldn't be able to do in a studio that you rented with some big producer and record it in three weeks. There were a bunch of like frauds anyway, most of them, to be honest with you. Most of the guys we worked with were all just kind of, they had the engineers and stuff, and they were just some name and had worked their way up by conning other people. There's a lot of that in this business. For all you young bands, you know, if you've got guys in your band that are super talented, don't question them. Go with them. You're the guys that are going to be playing the songs every night, not some slapjack. Can I cuss? I don't want to say bad words. I got kids. Yeah, you can. T- oh, well, if the, the some kids slap, are- slapjack, a jackass, you know, moron that's so full of his own shit that he thinks he everything he does is gold. And then you got to go play these songs every night. And this guy, you never uh, see. Uh, uh, so you're saying that people in the entertainment business are crooked? No, oh, I'm saying never. people in the, in the music <laughs> business. No, it's not all of them. No, no, there's good met, people. Uh, usually a lot of the engineers we worked with were really good, but the quote-unquote producers were just a name, just a phony baloney name that didn't do anything. It just puts and a I bad taste in your mouth. Of, we had an engineer on Autumn Effect, Ryan Webb. So that guy was the most talent, one of the most talented guys I've ever worked with. And, uh, you know, Brian Bodine, our old guy, he, he's got more talent in his pinky than all three of the producers we had with the major labels and their whole bodies. You know, well, one of them doesn't have one anyway. <laughs> <laughs> what about, uh, what about, uh, Dean DeLeo when you worked with him writing that track? See, he was an exception. That was just for one song, though. I would have done a whole record with him. Yeah. And the thing good. is, is a lot of, a lot that's going on in the States right now that's really popular is working with, with co-writers to write your hit singles and blah, blah, blah. And like, we're not interested in that. If, if we're going to do a co-write, we want to do it with a musician that has been doing it forever that we mm-hmm. look up to. We're inspired by it. So when the DeLeo brothers contacted us to work on stuff, we were like, uh, you're joking, you right? Wrote, you wrote those songs, <laughs> right? Yeah. Okay, yeah. cool. No, we, we, we were just, right? <laughs> we were just sort of floored that they yeah, even knew yeah, who we right, were. Right, right. right. We did a festival with him, and I rounded the corner, and Dean DeLeo goes, Tater, and I was like, this is crazy, man. What is going on? How do I know somebody in some of the pilots? So we snuck in the back door on rock and roll. We <laughs> snuck in the back door with the kids that, how did they get in here? Well, yeah. leave them alone. <laughs> I would have shit my pants. <laughs> yeah. And they're such this? nice people. They're man. nice. They're, and it's the thing is they all, like, people, they don't want you to act funny around them, you know? That's the worst thing to do. Just be normal. And they're normal. They're normal people. Just... They're just way better at music than we are. That's all. <laughs> yeah. that's all. They're one of a kind, that's for yeah. sure. Yeah, they so are, but you know, you guys have, you know, you got your own sound, and you, you're amazing songwriters. So, you know, thank you, don't, you. Thank you. you know, thank you. that's why you're doing yeah. what you're doing. Saying that we, it, it, that's the thing that I, I think that is really discouraging about this business to a lot of upcoming bands is people get having identity crisis and, and not knowing. How, what their voice is or how to find their true voice. And it, I just think it's crazy how this business will find you because you got noticed in your, your area for being you. And then you'll get signed and you'll have success for being you and, and using your voice mm. and, and, and your writing style. And then you'll have success. And then all of a sudden they send in cook, cooks into the kitchen to – to remold a bunch, you. Of, a bunch of business guys that come in and tell an artist how to paint or how to write or how to draw or anything like that. They're so they take of, away they that take authenticity away of you. Yeah. They think by all the, some spreadsheet that they got that, not that I'm bitter, <laughs> but they have some <laughs> spreadsheet they've got that this is what current is, is happening. And it's just not the reality of it. They, they're, are, they're business people. They're never going to understand artists. So they should shut their big mouths and let the artists do their thing. And I think that making music that, that really... It, it should left up to the fans. And if when you start putting all that stuff in the way, I think it really, it, it makes the music, it injures the music and stifles the music. It makes mm-hmm. it sound generic. And the artist is not allowed to, to be pure and honest. I mean, the Doors and Zeppelin and Floyd and all those Jimmy. fans, Jimmy, none of them would be where they're at if they had some co-writers in there telling them how to do it. Stifling them, as we would say, if you've ever watched the movie Walk Hard with Dewey Cox. <laughs> One of the best like movies ever style. made. Yeah. yeah. But, I mean, yeah, it's like uh, they're just, you know, it's basically a bunch of business guys telling artists what to do. And, it, and it, it, the modern rock radio in the States right now literally sounds like the exact same song from about 20 different bands. They've got a handful of writers that all write these band songs, and it sounds like the same homogenized kind of third, fourth, fifth rate, 
you know, Soundgarden or whatever. I mean, and I love Soundgarden, but mm. they did their own thing. And it's like, this what that's why modern rock radio stations in the States can't, because they're not playing anything new and exciting. They're playing the same crap they've been playing for 20 years, and nobody's listening to them. They're not getting any ad. Even our, uh, in Knoxville, Tennessee, our main station, you know, went away because the, you, they're not, they're scared to, because the business guys are scared to take chances on like, you know, well, we're, we've got to play Rob Zombie and this. We can't play the Black Keys or we can't, you know, it's like too defined. It's like if go, a good songs, a good songs, a good songs, a good song. Period. I agree, man. Well, I, I guess we're pretty lucky here on on Rabbit Radio. I get to I get to play whatever I want, anything from obviously you guys to Cannibal Corpse to that's that's what that's it, awesome. That's, that's, that's the way it should be. be. That's yeah. the way it should be. There should be that was what Soundwave was. It was to me. It was the greatest thing. I kept calling my wife every day, going just screaming at her. This is the greatest thing professionally I've ever done. <laughs> from having you know dinner with Vernon Reed or meeting Billy Joe Armstrong or hanging out with Chino or. Fast jaw or the Eagles of Death Metal blew me away every night too. I mean, it was it was surreal, and it's like you couldn't do that in the states because everybody's too busy keeping up with the Kardashians, you know. <laughs> Yuck. Well said. Don't even. I, I'm gonna I'm gonna edit that out that you even mentioned Kardashians. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Right, right. Let's that's, that's, that's a swear word. That's word. You know. Yeah, I think if but everyone's it's, true. it's unfortunate, but it's true. It's so true. I think if everyone just ignores them and stops paying attention to them. They'll, they'll, they'll disappear. They'll vanish into, they'll vanish up their own asses. <laughs> no, but it's the reality. Yeah. Queens of Stone Age on this last record had a great song about that, about talking about basically all our generation wants is, uh, is money and, and fame. It doesn't care about anything else. And it's interesting because you see these people because they have, are famous or their parents were famous or their dad's getting their, his wiener chopped off. It's like, <laughs> You know, they're, they're famous, and for whatever reason they are, they go they go and spend a bunch of money, and they act like rich bitch spoiled snobs. It's like, I you know, I don't I don't know. You know, let's move to Australia. Yeah, Where come I'm down at. here. Well, I mean, you you're gonna be yeah. down here and uh, playing in my neck of the woods too. Cool and get a hotel. The thing we really <laughs> noticed down there is that it seems like there is a a place for everything. It's not just a you have to fit the mold. It's like you said with with your station, you can play whatever you want, and you don't have to. It doesn't have to fit into this certain sound or this certain time frame or this easy listening or or rock or or indie rock or. But it's so you like know, that I mean, in the states should, or metal. Like you should, right. you should be able to play whatever you like. I remember growing up and being in this punk band in like tenth grade, right? And they didn't like it that I liked Jimi Hendrix or Nirvana. So there was like more rules in the punk rock band than there were when then hanging out with the jocks, which I always thought was pretty interesting. But it was always these people with like music. Well, oh, that band sucks. I'm like, they don't suck, you know, like they're not good, but they don't suck. You know, it's like there was always just like you have to be our band or the bands that we like. You have to be just like we're the conformist, nonconformist. You know, it's like you have to be like us if you don't. And then I got kicked out of the band because I dreamed too big. So I like to say hello to them right now. <laughs> well, you, of, of course, you know, as we were saying, cool and got a hotel uh, with uh, Dead Letter Circus. You're, you're buddies with those guys? Yeah, um, we've crossed paths with those guys a couple of times. And Just don't leave a bottle of vodka sitting around. They'll drink it up. They'll drink um, it up. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I was a fan of that band. A long time ago when they first came out i really have always enjoyed their music but to be able to kind of kind of become buddies with them has been great and the fact that we're finally making this happen because we talked about hooking up with those guys in this bringing them to the states and us going over there for a long time now and the timing was just never right and now it's finally happening so that's great we'll be half and half it's a big that's tour yeah, it, it's the most extensive tour we've ever done in Australia. Usually we just come in and do a couple of the big cities and, and leave. But we did play one headliner there years ago on, as a one-off, but we were there with Corn and Hatebreed mm -hmm. and Disturbed opening the show, but we did a one-off at a little bar there. And it was awesome. And it was awesome. I mean, I remember just thinking, like, man, this is like, you know, I don't know how old it is. What if ACDC had played here one day? You know, like, you're, I just kind of had this imagination of, like, seeing like this great rock and roll band in this little club and like we were on like holy ground or something i doubt it was even true but it's fun to pretend 
Oh no, there's a lot of places around. Well, the ones that are left, like a lot of those yeah. bands in the in the early days, they all they they used to play school halls. They played a lot of the venues, but I, I guess they've lo- knocked Basements. down a lot of them. Yeah, they.